And welcome to those who I, I may not have met. My name is Catherine Donnelly and I'm the Director of the Health Services and Policy Research Institute. And welcome, this is the last of this year's Inside Research and Research Rounds. So we'll be starting again in September. And if you would like to hear this presentation again or send it to people who may not have attended, um, this will be posted on YouTube as well that you can take a look at. Um, I just wanted to start um, by acknowledging that I am here today with you on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. And I've been here for 15 years and grateful to be on these beautiful lands and look out my window here today. This presentation is all about, we'll talk a lot about primary care data and how we use data. And Poplar also, I just wanna acknowledge, has an important component that includes Indigenous data sovereignty, um, which they'll be talking about here today, which I think is so important and thoughtful to conduct work like this, um, to help inform solutions that address health inequities. So I'm excited to hear about that today. Thank you. And I'm really grateful for both Dave, David Barber and Michelle, Dr. Dr. Michelle Griever. So Dr. Barber is a family physician at the Queen's Family Health Team. He holds a, a number of hats, which I won't go into all of them. Um, he, he's here today as the Regional Director of Simpson, and he's also the Digital Health Lead for the Ontario Health Team in our region. And he's one of the six leads of the Poplar Network, which you'll hear a lot about today. Dr. Griever is a family physician at the North York Family Health Team, and she's also with the primary care, a primary care researcher with family and community medicine at University of Toronto. She oversees Utopian, an EMR data system, and the U of T practice-based research network, and also one of the six leads of the Poplar Network. So very excited to hear more about the Poplar Network, as I'm sure many people are here today, and I will hand the floor over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Catherine. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see the screen okay? That's good, Dave. Okay, super. Thanks. And you can hear me okay? Uh, good. Okay. So thanks, everybody. And thanks for taking the time to uh, to join us here. I'm so happy to be presenting with, uh, with Dr. Griever. Uh, who I respect uh, so much, and uh, thanks, Michelle, for, for joining us here. So we're going to be talking about Poplar, and, you know, this is all very confusing. We're talking about these different networks and that, but I'll, we'll try and, you know, um, make it as simple as possible. Um, you know, I think that there's huge opportunity for, for research and for policy, um, you know, to start using primary care data, and we're going to talk about, you know, the importance of this and uh, why this network, this Poplar network, uh, you know, that sits within Ontario is, is, is so important for, for research policy and how it's going to be playing such an important role in the, uh, the OATS that uh, people are all familiar with. So this is the outline of the presentation. Um, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, ask questions through the chat. Catherine's going to be monitoring this and we do want to make this interactive. Uh, we do have about, I think, 35 slides in that. So I'll probably go through them fairly quickly, my piece. Uh, then uh, Dr. Griever is going to take over for, for a bit to, to focus on the research um, that's been done uh, or uh, that's in progress, and then I'll finish things off. But it would, I mean, I do think it's important to make this as interactive as possible. So uh, Catherine's and she'll interrupt us at when, uh, when she feels the need to do that. So. So why research in uh, primary care? Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, that it's really, it, it's really one of the opportunities, um, you know, for, for researchers and policies and maybe being ignored in the past. And, and, and this is why it's so important that we, we start developing this uh, within um, Ontario, within uh, Canada. Um, you know, the, the research in primary care, the studies are more pragmatic, uh, findings are more generalizable. Um, you know, we've created these practice-based research networks or learning networks, uh, which these networks, you know, sit within a community. Uh, you know, as an example, in Kingston, Kingston area, we have the Eastern Ontario Network that I'm a director of, and that encompasses, you know, 14 practices. So that means that in each practice, there's, you know, uh, primary care providers. They're part of this, this uh, you know, research network. They can ask questions. They can say, you know, uh, you know, hey, Dave, I want to see what my rates are of uh, hemoglobin A1Cs and diabetes, and I'm going to do this intervention. Can you help me uh, follow this and measure this? Um, 
you know, and within these networks, so you have the primary care, you have the, the family practices, you have uh, the primary care providers. And then, you know, as a backup, so sitting in, in Queens and Kingston, we have a research associate, we have people, we have a, a data manager who can help, uh, you know, create uh, research, uh, do QI um, at this very, very uh, local level. And you can see how important that'll be when we start to, um, you know, really develop the, uh, the oats, uh, especially We'll talk about that with the FLA OAT and and uh, and beyond. Um, so the practice-based research networks are really kind of key uh, to this, very local. Um, so you know, this is one of the things here that um, that was really kind of um, important to 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 realize. So here, these are this is over a month. The, the this would be the uh, the prevalence of of uh, people presenting with uh, illness. And so you start off with a thousand people. The key thing is that as you sort of winnow down this piece here, so 217 uh, visits are for primary care. When you have less than one of those end up in a hospitalized center. Another way to look at this is there's been research done and this is back, I think in 2014, but at that time there in, within a month, there would have been uh, 4 million visits to a primary care provider. Uh, but 110 admissions to hospital. So it just shows the, the scale of, of what's out there. And honestly, which is being in some ways ignored um, and, and, and why we think uh, these practice-based research networks uh, and this, uh, the, the, the Poplar network is so important for research and policy development um, in, in, uh, in our area and, and within Canada. So, uh, so what is Poplar? So essentially, uh, Poplar, um, it, it um, brings together uh, different um, practice-based research networks uh, in, um, in Ontario. So, um, so in Ontario, uh, there, we have, there are seven practice-based research networks, and we'll, we'll, th we'll throw those on a map later. But essentially, we have you know, a network in Ottawa, we have a network in Kingston, we have uh, a network in Toronto, we have a network in London, uh, in Hamilton, and uh, uh, we have one up north, and then we have one that's the CHCs, the community health uh, centers. And so all those networks, and, and each of them has recruited uh, practices, uh, have banded together essentially to create um, uh, to create uh, Poplar. Um, and you can see um, that uh, you know seven practice-based research networks, of about a, a thousand family docs are contributing data, 1.8 million patients as part of this this network. And then uh, we've just, I mean, it, even the, the ministry has has recognized the importance of doing this, especially I think around COVID. Um, and um, so they've provided funding now, and we hope that we get ongoing funding so that we're a stable uh, network and and uh, can provide resources that to, for for research and, uh, and QI. Um, so this is our, our vision, you know, to contribute to um, uh, Ontario's learning health system. We really, partnering with OATS is so important for us. And this is, the OAT piece is, is uh, presents so many opportunities uh, for us. And another reason that, you know, the ministry uh, is going to be funding this, because we think we can help uh, determine, you know, what the focuses of the OAT should be, and then also monitor outcomes um, um, or uh, changes because of an intervention. Uh, and um, so focusing on achieving the quadruple aim, um, and then uh, a centralized provincial EMR data system for analytics and, uh, and research. Um, so who is in Poplar? So this is the, this is the team. Um, so we have six universities, and then we have the Alliance for um, Healthier Communities, which are the CHCs. Um, um, it's a great group, um, really come together quickly, and uh, we've created really something quite um, unique and, and, and special in a very short time. Uh, Rick Lazier and Mike Green uh, are critical to this, and uh, Inspire PHC has really um, you know, uh, created this opportunity to develop Poplar and um, you know, they're helping with the coordination and, and uh, any research methods, financial, stakeholder engagement, patient engagement, and, um, and also uh, leveraging ICES um, to help with uh, what we're trying to do here. So this is our progress to date. I'm not going to go through everything, but there's been, this is, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes um, to create this, a lot of meetings, of course, and, and getting our structure in place 
Um, and uh, we've made huge amounts of progress. Uh, one of the things that we did do was recognize the importance of um, including, of getting more representation from rural uh, and northern Ontario. Um, and uh, that has been a huge success for us. And we have a great group um, in, the, in the North uh, network. Um, and I can say we also, you know, they have hired an Indigenous data sovereignty consultant who's on the, who's on the I think is part of this meeting today, Stuart Clendening. Um, and this is so, so important. You, it's, it's um, you know, the, the regulations around Indigenous data are, are a bit different. Um, and so we need to understand this and, and create, uh, you know, that repository so that we can um, help uh, improve the healthcare in those in those communities. Um, this is the structure, so you can see uh, this would be essentially be Poplar, and these are all seven of the networks. Uh, we have a steering committee that's led by Dr. Griever, advisory board, uh, patient council. Uh, these are our stakeholders, and you can see below, well, these are all of our, our committees or working groups. Uh, one of the ones that uh, Dr. Griever will talk about later, which will be important for this group, is our clinical research committee uh, led by D. Mangan. Um, out of uh, McMaster. Um, and then partnerships. Um, so the public, the public Health Agency of Canada. So uh, SIPSIN, and a, a, just a, a shout out to Rick Burtwistle, SIPSIN is the Canadian network. So it's uh, the Canadian network, uh, the Pan-Canadian network has 14 networks right across Canada, uh, BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, um, uh, Nova Scotia and uh, Newfoundland, we have networks, uh, at least one network in each of those areas. So um, SIPSIN is the national uh, uh, network, uh, whereas Poplar is our Ontario specific uh, provincial network. Uh, SIPSIN just received $1.5 million last year uh, to continue um, our, um, our uh, uh, data accumulation and, uh, and, um, and also surveillance. Uh, specifically, they're interested in post COVID syndrome and following patients. Uh, that have that and uh, what things develop from that. Other partnerships include Diabetes Action Canada, uh, ICES. Um, what do we provide? Um, research uh, and QI uh, to improve data and care, research support uh, linked uh, to researchers and innovative studies. I mean, and I think it's important to realize while data, you know, creating the repository of primary care data is important, but uh, each network has, uh, you know, as part of its backbone, um, you know, people who are, uh, are well versed in, in research um, and um, and can help uh, develop uh, projects. And um, you know, we do have capacity there for for that. The data, so we have the Poplar database, uh, which uh, which is Ontario. We said 1.8 million patients. Uh, you know, we provide practice reports for QI. We have a data analytics team. Um, and data support practice-based uh, clinical research and QI. And we also have access to the Canadian, pan-Canadian data, uh, which uh, is over well over 2 million patients at, at this stage. Um, so data, big sor sources of uh, big data, you can see here, um, just the, this is any sort of biomedical data that would be out, uh, out there right now. Uh, what piece do we sort of cover? Um, you know, these ones here, so some of the structured and some of the unstructured, um, you know, the, the, the structured data, um, you know, it take, still takes a lot of work to, to extract and to normalize. Um, the unstructured data even more difficult and we continue to expand uh, the type of data that we're extracting. And we don't extract every single piece of data from the primary care EMR yet. Um, but uh, we're getting there, we're moving into, into chart notes now, a huge amount of uh, valuable data within the chart notes, especially when we're looking at the you know, symptoms, let's say that occur in people with post COVID syndrome. Um, so this is an ongoing uh, process or ongoing thing for us to, to that, um, that we continue to, to do. Um, this is just what's happening in, in the UK. I mean, I think it'd be fair to say that, we, you know, we're behind in Canada. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, SIPSIN was created in 2008 um, and we've certainly grown, but I think that, um, you know, a lot of other countries are further ahead in, you know, the amount of data that they're extracting and the type of research uh, that has been done and policy created because of that, uh, because of that data. So, um, but, uh, you know, that being said, I mean, Poplar 
um, is a great example of the strides that we're making and, you know, getting government interested in the, in funding. This is so, so critical for us to, uh, to move forward. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just the data de generation. I mean, we're pulling data from, you know, family uh, docs, electronic medical records. Uh, that data is transferred to a secure area where it's standardized, cleaned, really messy. The data is uh, normalized. Um, we will split up any identifiable data into a secure enclave, um, and then we, we're left with a uh, with a you know de-identified. Uh, uh, data set and that's what, uh, what work is done. I think the important thing is that this is set up so that you can link data, right? So we can use the identifiers, health card numbers to link data to, uh, let's say, ICES data. This has been done in the past, um, you know, it could be linked to hospital data. Um, so, the, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, so what research can be done with Poplar data? This is where I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Griever. Okay, so um, getting all this data and managing it is not exceptionally helpful if you can't do anything with this. So as part of the infrastructure of Poplar, we're really leveraging the work that has been done in all of our networks. And, and that's the power of the group. This is an example of um, multiple projects that um, are either planned, being done, or already in the past. And you'll notice also um, that North is doing exceptional work uh, in, in Indigenous data sovereignty. And uh, as, as Catherine Donnelly mentioned, um, I, I think this, this is, um, you know, this is within our DNA um, from the start. Uh, and a key element uh, is respect uh, for First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is an example of um, uh, reports that can be provided um, using the data. So this is a report that was uh, published last year uh, from Utopian. And I think future reports will now um, be certainly at network level as well, but also provincial. So last year we focused on uh, caring for a diverse population and it showed how efforts were being made uh, to address equity in primary care. We're very, very grateful for the support of our department for this, um, but this can be leveraged to greater. And again, uh, really, you know, these types of reports can be provided to policymakers uh, to better explain primary care. And also, I'm hoping in the future, combined administrative data uh, from the important data holdings at ICES with popular data for these types of reports. Next. Um, this, uh, so we'll give you a little bit of an example of what's being done within committees. Uh, this is uh, my colleague, Dr. Karen Tu, who leads the data committee. Um, because we now have EMR data, our data is more comparable as well to international uh, data. So blood pressure is a blood pressure is a blood pressure uh, everywhere else. So Karen leads now a consortium of nine different countries. Um, you can see there it's called Intrepid. Um, there's a little bit over 85 million patients worldwide. So these are analysis done in parallel. Um, the first couple of publications are now underway. Um, and I don't want to scoop Karen, she'll be mad at me, but I will tell you that Canada is a real outlier for virtual care. We provide more than compared to our countries. And that's very interesting to us and uh, probably has some policy implications. Okay, next. So how do you access data? Well, again, because this is a, a collaboration between seven different practice-based research networks, we can leverage work uh, done at each of our uh, individual practice-based learning networks for the greater good. So the data um, is at the Center for Advanced Computing. It has been there for many years. Uh, we all started as members of Zipson. Um, so we know how to do this. It's, it's right here in Kingston. Um, once a project is reviewed and approved, then um, we provide uh, a data cut following the data set creation plan. And the data cut is put in the secure analytic virtual environment. There are now multiple projects running in there uh, to the point that we've run out of computing power and uh, we've actually borrowed um, several GPUs through Vector from um, another uh, organization, OHTP, and, and they're now at the stage so we can do more projects. Um, the access processes are being piloted at Utopian. Um, you can see the website there. Next. Um, and, um, you know, on our website, it tells you how to get it. Um, 
Um, because we now have several projects running through this pipeline, it gives us an opportunity also to improve um, how we provide data uh, access. So this is meant not to put financial or unnecessary administrative barriers. This is meant to make it as easy, affordable, and feasible for people to access data. We do insist that people partner with somebody familiar with the primary care EMR data. This is not because, you know, to put additional barriers, but this is to provide context. Uh, so at Utopian, we have a number of Utopian scientists. And in the future, and I was talking with uh, Dave about this, we should, we'll have popular scientists. These do not have to be primary uh, family physicians. They do have uh, to be people who are familiar with the data and can provide context. So this is to help the various uh, studies. Next. Okay, um, quality improvement. Um, so the data can uh, be used as well for QI activities, not uh, you know, beyond research. Um, this is an example of uh, a project that uh, my, my friend and colleague, Tomerly Wintermute, uh, did. Uh, she's the co-chair of Choosing Wisely uh, uh, Canada. And she said, well, you know, I ran a project where we provided um, information and leadership, et cetera, to try to reduce uh, you know, TSH testing that may be less necessary. So it may be used for screening purposes. Um, how do we measure this? We said, well, you know, what we can do is for the six family health teams that you involve, we can give you data on monthly rates of TSH testing, and we can give you information on monthly rates of TSH testing for those that didn't participate. You can see the red line for those that did participate. Typical for people who do this, they started off as somewhat better. You know, people who tend to volunteer for QI, for research are known to be people interested in quality. Um, however, um, there was a significant decrease compared to those who didn't participate. This is the single fastest acceptance a Canadian family physician I've ever had for any article. So they really like that. This is a really great example of marrying using data to measure QI very rapidly. Next. Um, we have been talking with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. So um, my colleague from Ottawa, Simone Rouge, and I had uh, several meetings with them. The CPSO is moving uh, towards a right touch, uh, towards right touch regulation, which means every five years, um, every family doctor, uh, once every five years, will do a, a QI. Uh, project and they have to look at their own data, um, they have to figure out how to improve things, etc. And the CPSO is interested in popular data because we can support this and make it easier and more feasible for family physicians to do their project. So next, so we'll be working with them on um, potentially enhancing the data-driven quality improvement part of their program. They're encouraging people to use external sources of data. And your own clean, standardized, and returned EMR data is a really good um, uh, element for QI. Um, we also work with um, other colleagues. So this is uh, my colleague, Tara Kieran, who leads the DFCM Quality and Innovation Program. Um, Adam Kogat, and his boat, is uh, a family doctor and an expert in machine language. And they're actually programming the QI dashboard. Uh, so this has been sent to uh, leads from um, uh, Tara's Quality Improvement uh, Program Committee, uh, currently at the pilot phase, and uh, it looks like it works quite well. Uh, it uses two-factor authentication, and each physician can see their own data um, compared to everyone else's. Um, the cost for this for physicians uh, will probably be zero if uh, we can get a bit of support, um, but this is well on the way now. And there you can see a uh, 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 time, time trends for uh, blood pressure measurement. Uh, I had a look at data from my own practice and I wasn't doing so well. So I have opportunities for QI as well. Now uh, the clinical research. Um, this is an important aspect of practice-based research and learning networks that, that sometimes um, uh, uh, has taken a backseat to data because we start with data, but it's no less relevant and no less important. Um, producing uh, our own evidence base in primary care will help to support better care. So there's the committee members, and it's very ably co-led um, by Dee Mangan, McMaster, and Andy Pinto um, at Utopian University of Toronto. 
So what do we want to do with clinical research? Well, you know, first of all, we have the committee. Um, uh, uh, the terms of reference and scope have been completed. Tomorrow, they'll be presented to um, uh, a popular steering committee for review and, and a vote on acceptance. The key principles uh, have been agreed upon and the key tasks. And here you can see that the first part is, let's find out where we are. Because, you know, we don't always know what research is being done in our various networks. So um, all of the networks have received a, a, a survey asking, well, what clinical research are you doing? Um, what training and resources are available? There's a very important one called Trudeau PHC. So we can certainly work with them and, and perhaps also embed uh, something about PBRNs or PBLNs within Trudeau PHC. And also many of us have worked with others across the border. So um, what examples we have of successful international clinical research networks? Um, we work a lot with the uh, US and if uh, any of you are interested, there's the upcoming coming, uh, uh, a PBRN conference from NAPRAC. And actually, I just heard uh, um, PBRNs are, are going to be funded by the Agency for uh, Healthcare Research, uh, $3.5 million to support infrastructure. So, you know, there's an international movement there. Okay, next. So what would we like? Well, the popular platform should provide some infrastructure support and resources for primary care clinical trials. There's no need for us to reinvent things for every single trial. Um, if there are um, highly trained personnel in one network, um, perhaps they can be used for trials in another network, just as we leverage the uh, experience and, and very significant abilities of our data managers to support multiple networks. Can we have peer support? Uh, for the network of networks. So this has already started. Uh, Andrew Pinto runs a monthly clinical trials group um, at Utopian um, in which uh, several other networks are now taking care. So how do we think about engaging primary care clinicians as part of the culture of curiosity in primary care? Next. Where should we go? Um, so how do we think about collaboration and recruitment? Uh, remember that CMHA article in uh, the first page? So clinical research in primary care um, compared to other countries, especially the UK, is somewhat behind, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so let's develop standard operating uh, processes for prioritization of studies. What is it that's important? Um, and how do we think about it? At Utopian, we already have a bit of a process, including review from our scientific advisory committee that includes patients um, and community representatives, representatives from all of our academic sites, ethicists, et cetera, you know, can that be leveraged? And how do we develop our capacity, which includes infrastructure and training? Okay, um, so you're, you're seeing this actually starting to happen under uh, DNA and Andrew's leadership. Next. Um, if any, anyone, if any of you would like to join the primary care trials group, it's uh, starting again after the summer in uh, uh, September. Um, so um, we've had people like uh, Peter Unai come to present and others. They're interested in working at primary care. And at the bottom, you can see uh, several uh, uh, research, clinical research studies that trials that the Utopian is currently supporting. So there's a lot we can do. Next. Uh, this is an example of a national study that several networks in Ontario are participating in. Uh, the National Institutes of Health was really interested in this as an example of research QI collaboration. So SPIDER um, is based in practice-based research networks in five provinces. It's about deprescribing uh, potentially inappropriate uh, medications for seniors on 10 or more medications. And that is 25% of our seniors. Um, it doesn't ask physicians to work harder. That doesn't work for us. What it does is it provides support. QI coaching, EMR data for audit and feedback, and IHI Institute for Health uh, Improvement Learning Collaboratives. It's a randomized control trial comparing these three elements, coaching, learning collaborative, and EMR data for audit and feedback to usual care. Outcome, using EMR data, deprescribing. Fewer meds for patients, for those taking 10 or more. So the NIH was quite interested in that and uh, asked us to present at uh, uh, a trans-NIH uh, meeting. Next. And of course, now we've also started working across the border, so international collaborations. Um, 
A couple of years ago, we got $8 million from uh, PCORI um, in the US, and this is currently running. Um, it's um, a, a randomized control trial comparing serious illness uh, uh, conversations for people with less than two years uh, life expectancy estimated by the family doctor in our communities. It is not comparing advanced care planning versus usual care. We think everybody should be getting uh, advanced care planning. It's, it's comparing advanced care planning as a team versus advanced care planning as individual clinicians. I think the team's better, but I don't know. And that's why we got money for a randomized control product. Um, recruitment is now complete. We should have results in about nine months. Next. Okay, and I'll hand it back over to you, Dave. Okay, great. Um, so one of the things that we can do uh, is um, is we can um, combine Poplar with uh, census data, and uh, this can help identify uh, different stratifications for uh, uh, social material deprivation, and we can create scores, um, you know, for for each patient. And really important uh, in how uh, we can um, identify patients, the vulnerable patient population, and uh, that offers multiple opportunities for, you know, both research and to help um, guide uh, policy. Um, and um, this just goes to the way that, the, 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 that we work based on the postal code and uh, using the census data, we essentially uh, can assign each patient uh, that, that social material deprivation score. Uh, and then it's associated with the patient um, and the research can, can happen from there. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, can be done and has been done is measuring deprivation, um, you know, to look at COVID. And you can see um, that, you know, COVID is disproportionately affecting uh, neighborhoods, uh, you know, with low, um, um, low income or just with single uh, parents. I mean, this is sort of, you know, uh, on the fly research, which is really, really important. And, you know, the more we develop, the more types of things like this can, can be done um, in, a, in a very, you know, quick way, um, you know, because we have access to that primary care data. Um, and then, um, so this would be uh, another study um, that um, a, an example of the type of, uh, you know, work that can be done, um, you know, that um, is looking at uh, how uh, poverty or the vulnerable population, how um, it affects uh, people's uh, health. This one was done by uh, uh, Kimberly Wintermute that uh, Michelle had taught before and, and also uh, Michelle. Um, the last piece that I'll talk about is really with the OATS and, I, and, and talking to Catherine and um, Elliot before, just the importance of and the opportunity for um, for working with uh, OATS. Uh, you can see here, so every blue circle is one of our networks in Ontario with the the seventh one are the CHCs, which is not on here, but, and then you can see the stars are where that, you know, the oats are, have been developed or in the process of being developed. And our idea really is to, um, is to link uh, every oat uh, with one of the practice-based uh, research networks. And this is really critical. So, you know, as for our oat, for the FLA oat, um, you know, as the, uh, as chair of the uh, digital uh, strategy uh, group for FLA OAT. Uh, one of my goals is to make sure that we recruit um, every single uh, family doctor, primary care provider within our OAT and uh, have access to their data. Because, you know, once we do that, you know, then we can, we can it, it affords the opportunity to link data with hospital and other types of data with ICS data. And it provides a platform to do the things that you know we should be doing within an oat and maybe as an example of that would be um you know let's say well and we know that within our region uh you know we have a high admission rates for people with copd exacerbations right so let's say that you we you know we link data between a hospital primary care and you could look in the primary care data and say, well, which, you know, which patients, um, you know, are on a, a large number of, you know, COPD medications, you know, have been prescribed antibiotics multiple times and steroids, you know, the ones that are, are maybe sort of getting close to that tipping point, but not, you know, quite there, not haven't reached the hospital yet, right? Well, then that if you can identify those patients within primary care, you know, then that opens up a program, um, you know, that could help, you know, that would be your intervention where you can provide added support uh, to those patients. 
uh, you know, um, check-ins and making sure that they have, uh, you know, action plans when they do develop an, an exacerbation. Uh, they would have a place to call when they're feeling unwell. And that would keep people uh, out of the, the going to emerge and less admissions, and they would improve the, the care of patients, right? So, but this that's a sort of that's the sort of thing that can only be done, you know, if you have you know the data, the end-to-end -end data, right? Primary, you know, secondary, tertiary care, and beyond. I mean, and and this is going to be so critical uh, within you know each O to have um the the full breadth of data so you know this we we know poplar knows uh, that we need to develop this it's going to be critical for us to do this uh, to ensure that we get ongoing funding uh from the government but uh you know huge amount of opportunity um there so um this is um you know an example of, from a north york general hospital that michelle did in terms of um you know, linking uh, data between the primary care EMR and, and the hospital. This can be done maybe more challenging in, in uh, the FLA region in Kingston because of the move uh, to uh, the Cerner platform, uh, but there's still lots that can be done and planned for uh, as we get there. Um, this is another example. Uh, this is uh, looking at the agreement between primary care uh, and the diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar. I think the important thing here is the linkage is possible, right? So you, we can link this data. We can, and once you have that linked data, it just gives you a better view of what's happening, you know, in the healthcare system from from end to end. So just some, um, you know, we've talked about the support. There's, you know, if you think, you know, essentially you just let your imagination go and, and you can think of all the ways that we could improve patient care, you know, and make our system more efficient uh, within uh, each OAT um, having uh, this data. Um, you know, it, it does also, I think, engage physicians um, and primary care providers uh, in, in how, you know, they can improve the system. There's, you know, so much that can be done at the, at the local level in terms of, let's say, you know, diabetes management. Um, and, uh, you know, we can help uh, engage, um, you know, providers um, and, and get involved in, in both QI and with uh, and research. Um, you know, so um, the implications for the health system for Poplar, so we can certainly scale up uh, initiatives uh, that have been, you know, tried and tested in, in one PBLN and, and put it to another. I mean, I think that this goes back, you know, to just being a sort of a laboratory, right? So you have these different networks and there's going to be amazing things that happen within each network. But then this will be brought up to Poplar and, um, and be shared. And then, you know, it can be, um, you know, uh, shared and then scaled up if it's something that, that has been uh, successful. Um, you know, we're going to be providing data, uh, you know, standardized data, uh, you know, much like uh, ICS has, it's going to be province-wide. Um, and uh, this is going to be, you know, something that's absolutely critical. Um, you know, we can, there, you know, this does allow us to give data back uh, to, um, you know, with the primary care providers in terms of reports, uh, maybe areas that they're, they're, where they're strong, areas where they're weak, um, you know, it allows for practice reflection, uh, you know, which, uh, which leads to, to QI. Uh, we talked about the linkages to hospital records, um, which is so, so important. Um, and, you know, those type of uh, you know, interventions can lead uh, to more efficient and, um, and better patient care. And then certainly, you know, coordinating clinical research and primary practices across uh, Ontario. So really big opportunity. Um, how do we strengthen uh, this? Just encouraging participation. That's, you know, I can talk locally and, and but certainly every network uh, and Poplar has you know, the uh, community engagement uh, group um, that is looking at recruiting uh, patients. We have 1.8 million, uh, but we, you know, we're going to scale up and, uh, in, and uh, make sure that we have good provincial coverage. Um, and uh, there's no reason why we couldn't get every, every uh, patient uh, in the province. Uh, just encouraging growth and then um, strengthening primary care uh, as it enhances equity, inclusiveness, and overall health for patients' populations. And that's it. It's good timing. It's perfect timing. Thanks so much, Dr. Barber and Dr. Griever. So much was going through my mind and, and so impressive to see this provincial network come together. You know, we talk about learning health systems. 
and you know this is really at the the underpinning of you know how do we make data useful and you know even thinking about it neighborhoods so people can see their own data and and make sense of it regionally there's been some questions i have a number but i will keep them to myself um, Rochelle Ashcroft is asking, what kind of data is being captured from the interprofessional health providers? Michelle, do you want to take that one? And... Sure. So um, within family health teams and interprofessional teams, um, uh, within community health centers, people enter the, uh, their information in the common EMR. So when we extract um, all the data, that comes out as well. But simply extracting data is, is the first step. Right. So what you have to do is um, you have to um, uh, look at it, you have to validate it, right? You have to make sure that the uh, reports that you're providing are accurate. So we have the data. We know there's interprofessional care um, within several of our networks. This has not been examined. Oh, I see Jennifer Rayner here. I think the CHCs at the Alliance and EPIC, uh, their network is much ahead. And again, an opportunity for us to uh, think about which network has done things very well. So CHCs, you know, the Alliance is uh, exceptionally strong in terms of collecting uh, data to, uh, on equity, on the social determinants of health. So we have the data. If this is an area that's important for you, uh, please contact us. Um, it will need a little bit of funding. It will need people. The first step is to examine the data and to validate it. Once you've done that, it's available not only for your project, but also building for the future. Uh, Jen, did you want to have another comment? Jennifer? It's, it's okay. I put it in the notes. Okay, excellent. I mean, I can answer it. We, we have all the coded interprofessional team data um, going into Poplar, and it's also linked at ICS so, and KaiHai. So we've done a, a, a pretty good job kind of coding it, standardizing it, and making sure across all of the providers it's consistent and linkable. That's exciting. Well, I can see the benefit of, of bringing all the networks together. So, you know, with one network does one thing and then, you know, it spills to the, the larger popular network. Exciting. I'm just going through the chat here. Um, Dr. Bagnoli asks, what's the capacity for using scanned PDF documents in the EMR within popular? Yeah, so we're, this is, you know, when we, you know, when Sipson was started, uh, we, we, it's always a subset of data that's within the chart, but over time, and we recognize there's value, um, you, you know, in the, in having the whole chart. So one of the challenges, so PDFs present, present a bit of a challenge, but, you know, the technology is there. And so we, as part of, um, as part of COVID and following um, post-COVID syndrome, we need to identify, we need to create a cohort of every um, COVID positive patient in, in Canada. And, and in some provinces, uh, the data comes in uh, as a discrete structured data. Uh, Ontario is, is unfortunately, it is, is some of it's PDFs, right? Which is very problematic. And so part of the funding from FAC was to create uh, a, the technology to essentially take those PDFs and uh, use uh, uh, optical character recognition uh, along with natural language processing um, to identify those patients who are COVID positive. So there's no reason that we can't extract the data from um, every single PDF. It just It's just a matter of having uh, the funding and the capacity uh, to do that. So and it, it's very, very important data. So there's lots of there's a few questions about ICS and Poplar. So the first one is, can you clarify the relationship between ICS and Poplar? Um, and before the data on the two sites are linked, do researchers have to join both networks? Michelle, do you want to take that? Sure. So um, the data are extracted to the Poplar data platform. Um, that sits outside of ICS, and that is where the data are cleaned, merged, standardized. Um, so once we have the popular de-identified database, this is available to researchers. Um, once your project's approved, we'll put it in the secure analytic virtual environment. Um, and once you're vetted, you know, there's, there's some paperwork you can have access to that or use uh, the popular analyst to analyze your project. We also now have agreements to send a, uh, a, a cut of the data. So this is selected data elements to ICES, where they will be linked um, with ICES data. This has been done for many years. 
um, by the Alliance. So we have expert, ongoing expertise. Um, it has been done in 2015 as part of a, a pilot for several networks uh, in Sipson in Ontario, so now Poplar. Um, and we have all the agreements uh, starting with um, uh, Utopian and North. So if you would like to access the Poplar data um, as it is standalone on links, please ask us. If you would like to access the, the popular data that has been linked at ICES, um, then um, please, uh, uh, you'll need to go through these usual ICES processes. These data are what's called a controlled use data set, which means that once a request is made, ICES will come to talk to popular. You know, we'll review it and we'll say, yeah, it's fine. I'm pretty sure Jennifer will say, yeah, it's fine for every project. So again, taking the lead, um, of the Alliance, which has been doing this for many years. Um, so think about what type of data you, you want. The linked data is, is gonna be a little bit more difficult and more expensive, and that's normal because it's enriched data through linkage. And I'm just looking who's on the line. I don't know if, if Joan Tranmer or Den want to comment further. I, there's another question with regards, and again, it's just a follow-up, and I think you might have already answered this, Dr. Reber. So if you've already joined ICS and are part, an ICS scientist, can you access all of Poplar's data or do you go through sort of both mechanisms? Um, the data going to ICS will not be all of the Poplar data. So for example, we do not have the data sharing agreement, the data transfer agreement that we have with ICS does not include free text and clinical notes, et cetera. So it's a partial uh, amount of data. And, and you know, again, please talk to ICS and talk to us, see what you're interested in. If you would like to access the full Poplar data, um, then that will go through the, the, the Poplar processes and it will be put in secure analytic virtual environment at the Center for Advanced Computing. So it depends on your project and it depends on what, you know, what questions you have and what data um, that would be as helpful as possible for your question. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. I'm, I, there's no more questions right now in the chat. I'm sure there's lots of questions um, from everyone here if they'd like to unmute and, and ask Dr. Barber or Dr. Griever a question. Hi, it's Rick Burt Whistle. Um, I, 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 Michelle, this is a long way from the Redfish Manifesto. Congratulations for <laughs> moving this forward to you and, and Dave and others who are involved in this, that it's, uh, it's fabulous, uh, the work that you've done. I guess my question is um, uh, around vendors and uh, timeliness of data and particularly around thinking about QI activities. Have you made any progress in uh, getting the vendors to play ball? What a so, loaded question, eh, Dave? I don't know how should wow. we answer this? <laughs> who, who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think, uh, you know, we, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, developing relationships with um, really three big vendors in Canada and, uh, and, and, you know, people complain about TELUS all the time. Uh, you know, the big movement at, at TELUS though has been that the, um, you know, they uh, are moving to a new platform and TELUS Health, um, the, the um, EMR division is now being led uh, by two family doctors, which is, uh, which is great. And we, you know, we, we know them, uh, we, Michelle and I have a meeting next week, uh, with, uh, Panit Seth. And, um, so, uh, we are making really good progress and, and they are really super keen on this. I mean, that they, uh, they want to work with us. They want to work with, you know, CWC with Choosing Wisely Canada. Um, so I think we're going to make really good progress uh, on, on that front. We have good, great relationships with the other vendors. So our goal, I mean, certainly with QI, right now we're doing Q6 month extractions. Uh, you know, we're going to do, we will move to quarterly uh, for Poplar uh, quarterly. And then, you know, um, we are actually, we have the technology within one of those vendors to do uh, nightly extractions, right? So we just do Delta upgrade, up, update extractions. So we have daily updated data and that ultimately would be our goal uh you know but that's going to take some resources and and a, a bit of time and a bit of uh relationship nurturing to get there 
Thanks. There's an interesting question. Dr. Bayomi has a question about more specifically, you, you touched on the Indigenous health data governance and just describing that a little bit more in detail and how that works. Michelle, do you want to take that one or do you, do you want me to take that one? So this is um, for Indigenous. Uh, um, so I, uh, I see you, uh, um, uh, you're on, would you feel comfortable um, describing progress on that? And Barb, you're, you're here as well. Um, because this is really led by your colleagues at North. I can certainly start. So my response is that this is um, uh, work that we're intentionally approaching um, and uh, is evolving, I would say, actively. So I think what we've been grounded in is very much the importance of involving communities um, and uh, reaching out directly to communities. And so at NOSM, we're doing that. We're exploring sort of what literature does exist with respect to using Indigenous data and frameworks um, that are in place. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a bit of a vague response in that um, we've committed to the process. Uh, Stuart is relatively new in his position, um, um, but we're uh, yeah, approaching it intentionally and hope to be able to share, share, share more uh, that would be meaningful. Certainly right now, I think in the data that we collect at North, there are not any Indigenous identifiers. And so as we move forward, that's a question we'll be asking if that's worth collecting and how do we use that and what are the um, processes in terms of how that data is used and comes back to community for uh, for permission. Um, um, and also the other piece I would highlight is uh, what questions do communities have for us and how can we support being able to answer, uh, answer those questions with the resources uh, and expertise that we have access to. So very much being explored. I'll just add a little bit to that, Barb. Uh, I know you guys have reached out and you're with Chiefs of Ontario and their group. Uh, they're quite embedded within the ICS infrastructure in terms of access to uh, Indigenous data through that network. And so uh, that is another avenue where people can access Indigenous data. Thank you. Um, there's a few other questions. I'm just Again, if people want to un unmute, but uh, there's some other ones in the chat. Thinking about recruitment, and so there's a question from Jennifer, Jennifer Lawson. I don't know if she wants to elaborate here, but essentially about what are the how are how are you looking to recruit, and what are the incentives? Yes, and, multiply by two for the cities where we have and what are the incentives for recruitment? Um, so this would be part of the. Uh, 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 clinical engagement committee um, and um, for you know right now one of uh, the recruitment um, areas that we were focusing on are, are around the fits I mean it's it's kind of it's an issue really of low-hanging fruit right I mean and so um, getting groups of uh, of primary care providers to sign on you know really is is one of our strategies um, at the beginning um, and also, you know, creating linkages within each ode. I mean, this is all so new, uh, but it's really connecting uh, with the, you know, every ode will have its own digital technology group. So making sure that we, we connect with them and, um, you know, make sure they're aware of the value and the possibility to extract that data. You know, it's interesting, the, the question about the recruitment piece, you know, when, when Sipson started off, and, and certainly Rick can attest to this, um, you know, there was actually money that was uh, there to pay physicians uh, to participate in, you know, Sipson. And the, the, the interesting piece is that, um, um, you know, most family doctors do it um, out of a sense of altruism, right? I mean, they want to uh, contribute to research. They want to improve to, uh, you know, they want to, you know, contribute to uh, QI. And so, you know, um, they didn't really ask for much as long as they were, you know, as long as they feel like they're improving the system and the care of patients. 
then that's uh, enough. Now, that being said, we do provide, um, you know, provider reports, um, as Michelle talked about, uh, you know, giving each uh, provider, uh, you know, uh, the number of patients, the ones with diabetes in it. There is a mechanism to um, allow us to identify their diabetic patients and create a cohort of patients for them to study. And, you know, if, a, you know, we've had, you um, you know, physicians reach out to us and say, um, hey, I'm, I'm doing this, um, you know, QI project. I want to, can you please identify this, this or that? And we're happy to do that. Every doctor uh, and primary care provider knows about that. So that's another uh, incentive. I think, you know, moving forward, the, the issue that uh, Michelle talked about uh, with the college, I mean, because that's going to be mandatory, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, a service that Sipson can provide uh, to make, um, you know, the, the certification uh, much more um, uh, uh, easy for uh, individual physicians to, to get their certification. So, uh, you know, we know we need to provide something in, in return. Uh, but, you know, it's an interesting, the altruism piece to contributing research is, is a big part of this, which is really nice. That's excellent. I, there, we could actually have a conversation for at least another good hour just looking at the, the chat. But I just wanted to end on the one question. I think it's a good summary question. Um, just in terms of if you go to the popular website, which I'll put a plug in, it's at the very top of the chat. Um, there are just questions around more detailed information about your data there, but I'm also going to ask, Michelle, you had put up a, a link to how to access the Emerald data, but there's no link right now on the popular data, so just sort of maybe we could end on sort of what can people expect going forward to, to get that. Yeah. So the popular data infrastructure is now getting set up. Um, the um, RED approval for changing the name of the uh, Utopian Data Safe Haven, it no longer exists, is the popular data platform. Um, North Data, thank you, Barb and Brienne, are there already. Uh, we're completing the requirements for the Alliance and all the other networks are putting forward their RID uh, application to enable this. So we do not yet have a full popular database. I expect this towards the end of the year. Um, if you would like to test the data, um, you can, um, uh, I, I put in one of the slides had how to access data for Utopian. You will be getting data from uh, initially North, but you have to ask, right? It's a, it's a controlled data set and from Utopian um, for your study, one of our requirements is please partner with somebody who's familiar with the data. Okay, so it's already available for a selected location, or you can also go to each individual uh, network. If you are okay waiting for a couple of months, I think Dave, it's quite reasonable for the uh, 2021 Q4 um, to expect a constituted database. However, the infrastructure is now there. It's built. The other thing would be, Michelle, we could go to the SIPSA National Database, to the SIPSA National Database, and there's a sample data set that, you know, really is, is um, you know, a, I guess an example of the type of data that, that exists at, uh, within Poplar, the primary care uh, data. So that would be something else you could do. And that that's there for, for download as, as far as I understand. So, Well, I'm just looking at the time and it's just almost one on the nose. So I just want to say thank you to you both. Um, really exciting, tons of interest and engagement. I know this is just the starting conversation. And, um, can't wait to see all the work that's being done from here. So thank you very much on the behalf of, of history. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.